that is uh, set up outside really the the medical system is, is public health testing and surveillance. So that's one where, area where we kind of got in trouble as a as um, you know a nation as a state because we didn't realize that there was this virus SARS-CoV-2 circulating in January. In February, mostly because of the, t the, the testing for that virus, even though uh, the sequence for that virus is already um, well known, the, the tests just weren't there and we weren't um, doing surveillance uh, of the population at a level that would have um, really been helpful in shutting down and changing the course of, of a pandemic. So, and then, so as we started to get into the pandemic in March, uh, our main test that we had was. Um, the polymerase chain reaction, which is DNA amplification. You get a tiny amount of DNA and you amplify it over and over and over. And and you get a positive test or a negative test. And those tests were hard to come by. Um, and they were, but they were great to see really if somebody had the disease um, in that time period. And well, we, um, there's still quite a shortage of, of that testing in, in particular parts of the country. And, and in the world. So the, um, these kind of tests are hard to come by in many different countries. And there's just a limit on how many uh, PCR, or basically RNA amplification tests can be, um, can be done on the planet. Um, everyone's using the same stuff. So there's been more push recently, especially from the public health community to um, ask the FDA for uh, more types of tests uh, that provide decent accuracy. So uh, there are antigen tests that look for um, the antigen for SARS-CoV-2 um, that are available now, three of them, and uh, some more in the pipeline. <clears throat> They're relatively simple. And in differentiating between diagnostic and surveillance testing, that's where the need is, is where is we, we all would like to get tested more frequently to know we're not spreading it uh, to others. And so we could, you know, feel more comfortable around our family members. So there is a, a large need for cheaper and easier to do testing. So um, public health experts are hoping for um, tests that are much cheaper than what is available right now, even though they're covered by insurance and aren't you that don't need a uh, doctor's order to do. So ideally, uh, the um, public health infrastructure in the United States would have been stronger and we uh, might have mass produced uh, tests that um, are done by saliva and can be done uh, something like two or three times a week. And uh, they're not quite as sensitive as a PCR test, but if you do them uh, at that frequency, uh, then the sensitivity is just as, uh, is essentially just as good and you also know better when your period of infectiousness is. So right now still uh, the PCR test uh, tends to be positive at, towards the, at the beginning of the illness, right when right before symptoms start, a couple days before, and then we'll, um, the period of infectiousness is seven to 10, about 10 days, sometimes a little longer. Um, but that test, the PCR test could remain positive um, for several weeks later, even though uh, it uh, is not saying that you're infectious. We treat all those people right now as if they're infectious. It's one of our challenges. Uh, but at that point, after 10 days, you've made antibodies. The virus level in your body has gone down to nil almost. And what you're detecting on the PCR test is little fragments of the virus RNA. Um, and we get a quantitative number for that. Uh, but um, that's just in the lab. It's not available uh, for the physician. Let's go. Let's go to the um, next slide. So um, in March, um, there was a lot of debate about masking. This, uh, we were a little unclear on the science in the United States. But we, I would say, by the end of March, most hospitals had a mandate, and were and most people were already masking universally inside. And as the pandemic has gone on. We've seen uh, more and more data showing how important masking is. So if you're taking care of COVID patients in March uh, and maybe into April, you know, you were pretty, you were worried, you weren't sure if you're going to be protected. 
we had good PPE at Marin Health. I want to thank the leadership for really um, acting quickly. And I think everyone had the right PPE. And we really have not documented or did not early on document any uh, significant healthcare worker outbreaks at uh, Marin Health. So um, now, though, um, as time has gone on, the masking has been in place in hospitals around the country. Um, that has really protected healthcare workers. And there's recent data that in mo in major university centers, uh, the proportion of healthcare workers who have antibodies showing uh, infection is, is generally lower than the population at antibody rate. Uh, and we feel now um, even that uh, inside the hospital is really one of the safest places to be um, compared to, say, going to the supermarket. Uh, but um, so first we start out with masks who can protect other people around you because you're not spraying droplet that's, um, and that can infect them, which is the primary mode of infection. Now we're saying um, it also uh, may uh, it's likely that we are also protecting ourselves to some degree. So if we inhale some droplets, the amount we inhale is going to be significantly less, even through a cloth um, mask. Um, and that's really important because that means you get less inoculum, less virus inhaled, and that translates to less severe disease. So now what we're seeing is when places like meatpacking plants and cruise ships where everyone's masked, they go from no masking to everyone's masking, uh, then you'll see rates of infection at, uh, that are asymptomatic at like 95%. That's pretty amazing. And that's, that's part of the reason why we really think that masking is so important because it can make, even if you get infected, you're gonna have mild disease, maybe no symptoms and develop some immunity. Um, so uh, Dr. Um, Monica Gandhi, at UCSF has, has kind of developed this theory that it's a bit like getting a vaccine, having a mask and getting a tiny dose of the virus and not developing symptoms. Uh, and overall, the, the impact on uh, morbidity and mortality, both for healthcare workers and patients around the globe, has really improved with masking. Uh, next slide, please. So um, this is this has been our curve, and just to point out, uh, this is data from today, um, and just to point out the difference, you can't see the number difference between the green, the brown in the middle, and the red, but it's basically about um, uh, what we're at, where we're at now is 200,000, and they're saying at the end of the year, 378 um, um, projected deaths. If that's the, that's the middle curve, if we um, did intense masking around the United States, that number would be a lot lower, probably just a little over 300,000 if I'm reading this graph carefully. So that's how big the impact of masking is, and, uh, and a lot of models support this now. Next slide, please. Um, so um, I want to talk about masking first, and then, and then pretty soon we're going to have some vaccines. I don't think the average American is going to have access to a vaccine until sometime in the spring. Um, but there's gonna be some healthcare workers in the United States who are gonna get vaccinated uh, before the end of the year, uh, we hope. Well, we can't predict how these trials are going, but the data look good. Um, the process that's in place for vaccine safety is really great and really rigorous if it's adhered to. Uh, so. Um, many, many experts around the country, just that's what their work is, is, is vaccines and vaccine safety. So I think if we stick to the process we have where we have independent uh, safety review boards, then, uh, and they just go about their normal business, then um, we're gonna have a safe and fairly, what looks to be fairly effective vaccine. Tricky thing is gonna be sorting out um, the different vaccines. So for example, one person may have vaccine A, someone else has, vaccine C, are they comparable? Does that provide the same amount of protection? And we don't, we don't know that yet. Um, but um, it, the, one of the major points of the vaccine is that um, if you get it, even if, even if it doesn't protect you fully, it can provide enough um, um, benefit and protection such that you don't develop severe disease. And that's really the big problem. No one wants to see people with severe disease, COVID-19 and in the hospital. Next slide, please. So this is what we have going on right now. Um, 
in, in Marin. Uh, this is from the county website. Um, it's, it's on my next slide. And I urge you to take a look at that and stay informed because really it's one of the best places to, to answer your questions about what's going on. And, and you wanna stay informed, you wanna stay up to date on, on where we're at in terms of uh, our stages of opening. Right now we're good in, in red. I think that's, that's a really good step. Our numbers are looking good. Um, and there's lots of data here to see where, where, we're, where we're trending as well. Next slide, please. Um, and one other point is people who do get severe disease, it's, it's not like they get a great recovery. Um, people who have severe disease, there's a lot of inflammation and this, the science on this is just coming around, but they have a lot of inflammation that, that causes a lot of clotting. There's significant problems with clotting with people with COVID-19 and there's definitely episodes where it can cause uh, pulmonary embolus, stroke and so forth, it's, um, heart attacks. And um, people can be left fatigued um, and, and feeling like they're not themselves for months after uh, ha an initial episode, especially at severe disease. So next slide, please. Uh, so our challenges right now, we need a more comprehensive, coherent national strategy um, that relies on science, infectious disease expertise, public health expertise. And so right now, if you ask infectious disease and public health people, we say, our, you know, the federal response has not been good. It, it should be a lot more unified. Um, we need more testing that's cheap for the general um, population. I wish the tests were on a piece of paper and that's technically possible. It could be mailed to every person in the United States and they could check themselves two or three times a week um, and we shut down outbreaks fairly quickly. We need to um, support public health surveillance now for, um, and get ready for the next pandemic. Um, many experts think that this is kind of a warm up. Um, and so we need much more public health infrastructure support. Um, this winter is gonna be a challenge, but um, for, um, because of influenza and COVID, but we have um, some good testing systems set up at, at Marin Health and in the clinics uh, as, and Kaiser does too, um, to help um, do the test for both pathogens in the winter. And overall, I, I think we just need to look at the fact that if you have a healthier population, um, less infections, you have a healthier economy. Next slide. Um, I'm not gonna go to those details. Let's go, let me go to the next slide. Um, do we, it'd be good if we had some more, um, some more testing like um, we wanted in January where people would give samples and they could be PCR for all kinds of pathogens. We should be looking more in, um, at a larger segment of the population and testing for all kinds of things at all times. Just kind of like we look for weather. And there's ways to um, be prepared to do um, set up PCR testing on a mass scale a lot quicker. Next slide, please. So for now, at this point, masking whenever you can, uh, even if you have a mixture of people at your house, mask indoors, especially. The transmission indoors is like 18 times greater in general than outside. Hand hygiene is important and helpful. Um, try to prevent overlapping of cohorts. Like if you have one group of kids you keep them together and try not to mix the kids between the groups because uh, they're not so good at protecting themselves. And one of the other things is, is um, this really associated data from CDC, this is like going to a restaurant or people are twice as likely to have had COVID. So maybe take out, um, I'd say you wanna refrain from social events in person and you wanna help out other people in need and you wanna take care of yourself, get a regular exercise, do stress control. That's really important. It helps your, your immune system, uh, your T cell response. And the T cell response is probably just as important as the B cell response for um, how well you're gonna respond if you get sick. So you gotta take care of yourself and your family, exercise, get your sleep, and then mask and do the rest of that stuff. Uh, and so I'll be happy to take any other questions if people have uh, at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tolliver. That was uh, very, very informative. And remember, folks, you can chat your questions or you could enter them in the Q&A panel, and I really encourage you to do so. At this time, we'd like to turn it over to Dr. Elizabeth Lowe. Um, she's been heading up the mobile testing as part of the COVID-19 task force, so please take it away, Dr. Lowe. Uh, hi there. Um, I don't have the fancy slides that Dr. Tolliver has. I mostly have pictures from my work out um, in the field, as we say, uh, because back in April, uh, when this pandemic first started, Dr. Eric Piper 
basically gave me a van from the hospital and said, go out there where we're having outbreaks and see what we can do to help. And so we set forth um, out into the skilled nursing facilities and the residential care facilities uh, where the prevalence was high and the death rate um, was high also. Um, and as you can tell from the data that's come out over the last six months, that's still where the highest, unfortunately, where the highest death rate is in the county. Um, it's 84% of the deaths that have occurred in the county have occurred in these long-term care facilities, either skilled nursing facilities or residential care facilities. Um, and 96% of the deaths have occurred in the over 65 uh, population. Um, and Marin County is the oldest county in California, meaning the population is the oldest uh, and, and healthiest most of the time. But these people who are in these residential care facilities are at high risk because they have close proximity to each other. They're indoors, just like Dr. Tolliver said, that's one of the risk factors there. And, and they share rooms. Um, and then they have the healthcare workers who are coming in um, from often high risk areas who are coming in to provide care. They've been the heroes in all of this day in, day out, coming to care for these high risk patients. And the healthcare workers themselves, there's a 20% prevalence of, of positivity in the healthcare workers. Um, a lot of them are asymptomatic, which makes it that much harder. You can't screen um, based on symptoms or a temperature. You have to screen by testing the healthcare workers. Uh, there were initial testing of healthcare workers. 25% of them were tested every week so that it was on a rotating basis, and we've still not been able to contain outbreaks in facilities. So just recently they have um, establish a new mandate where the staff is getting tested weekly um, to prevent this transmission because the transmission is occurring from the healthcare workers who are showing up day in, day out to provide care for these vulnerable patients who are actually transmitting it to the residents. Um, so in April, that's where we started. We realized that we both had to uh, test these healthcare workers um, in the facilities and in their homes. Um, because that their chances of contracting it were far higher out in the community and in their homes. So we tested half in the community and half in the skilled facilities. Uh, we moved to community-based testing half the time in May where we were paired up in the canal uh, with Department of Public Health and we uh, began testing there half the time and half in the facilities, which we were doing in conjunction with Kaiser. Uh, we uh, partnered with Marine Community Clinic late in the summer because we realized most of these patients who were seen in the canal districts were cared for at Marine Community Clinic. The Marine Community Clinic has stepped up and began caring for these patients and has now started to oversee all the testing in partnership with Department of Public Health. Um, and we at Marine Health have moved back to the skilled facilities where our vulnerable patients still are. Um, and we have become inadvertent um, experts in caring for these patients. We are, as primary care physicians, we're designed to, to uh, do this best because we have learned infection prevention. We have learned caring for these patients when they turn positive. We have learned how to do outreach with the families. Um, and we've established good uh, relationships with all these facilities, all these nursing homes. And, as a primary care doctor, I never used to go into these facilities. I was in my office separate from where my patients were. And now I have been, that's my van, now I have been on site um, in all these facilities and really gotten to know the, the uh, director of nursing in most of these places. Um, we've moved towards building up a relationship with these facilities better. The medical directors a lot of times are not as present as we would like them to be. We feel that these residents are still at high risk. Um, so we have moved to broadening our ability to care for them in these, in these settings. Uh, because of the nature of these facilities, it doesn't require a physician to be on site. In a skilled nursing facility, a medical uh, doctor or professional only needs to see the patient once a month. And a lot of times that's not helpful during a pandemic. You need more of a presence. You need more care in that moment, you need more outreach and connection with the families. And uh, these days I have a, a laptop or my phone, I actually don't have that picture, 
where I go into the room in the PPE gear, I'm establishing a connection with the family member via a phone, and I'm examining the patient so that the family member can see that their, their loved one is cared for because there's not a lot of family visitation. Um, and they just get to have that connection, which is really meaningful because these residents feel like they have lost all connection with the outside world and the family members haven't been able to see their, their loved ones. So we've established that connection again, which has been, um, as a primary care provider, has really been very gratifying to be able to, to provide that. We also try to have goals of care conversations, palliative care conversations, if that's the resident's wish or the, um, their, their preordained wishes in the past. We try to have those thoughtful conversations that are oftentimes difficult but are necessary. Uh, so we view that as our current work um, as we've moved back to the skilled nursing facilities um, uh, and residential care facilities. That's our primary goal is back to our care of our patients. It's made a little bit difficult because we have so many different providers. We're not Kaiser, we're not an intrinsic insurance system as well as a care system. So there are a lot of gaps. There are a lot of roadblocks along the way. Um, as I said before, a lot of these patients have primary care providers out in the community. They're not always in connection or communication with the, with the facilities. And so we're trying to create a whole new pathway that really cares for all these people way better than the system that we currently have. So uh, with Dr. Piper's blessing, uh, we have moved forward. Our, he's, he's given us the goal of going out to provide better care, and then we fill in the blanks for how that happens. Um, but that has, um, that kind of summarizes our work to date. We, um, over the summer, had also created a college student internship program um, for these college students who didn't really have much to do over the summer in the way of jobs or connection, and we had six amazing college students who worked with us all summer and they were, uh, they provided invaluable work and they got an incredible experience. And they have all basically all gone back to colleges Two have now decided they want to do careers in medicine, which is exciting. And one wants to do a career in public health. Um, so that's been a really fun project to also work on. Uh, that's us and with our van parked in the back of one of the skilled facilities where we do our uh, on-site testing and then we stay and assess the patients who have turned positive, um, the, you know, if they've turned positive over the course of our, uh, our break outbreak testing. We test twice a week if there's an outbreak in a facility so that we can rapidly cohort patients and, um, and, and then for various pictures of various facilities where we've been over the month, um, bring back good memories. <laughs> um, but that's our work right now. Um, it's been a, an honor and a, a privilege to actually be out in the community in a place where I uh, live to be able to care for our vulnerable populations, both the high-risk canal district and in the high-risk um, care facilities. Um, that's, uh, let's see. We've been to so many places, I've almost lost track of them all. I need to start titling my photos better. Uh, there is a picture, I think the next slide is the picture with the college, uh, nope, that's another residential care facility. I think one more slide is, uh, yeah, those are our college student interns, the tall ones and the short ones, that's all of them, which has been a great, uh, really great group of kids, really great group. Um, I think there's one last one. Oh, that was our last day testing in the canal in health before we turned it over to uh, Marin Community Clinic. As you can see, we, we always had fun. We made it fun. So it's been a, um, it's been a, good, a good opportunity to learn pandemic medicine. And I'll take any questions later also. Thank you so much, Dr. Lowe. Um, yay, healthcare heroes. Okay, um, now we're going to turn it over to Dr. Lee DeMon no, to, to Mr. Lee DeMonico, um, and he's going to give us an update about the uh, activities of the Marin Health Medical Center and how he has worked to keep everyone COVID safe during this last little while before we finish up with Dr. David Klein on what we're going to be doing going forward. So, Lee, please take it away.
Next slide, please. Okay, uh, good evening. The first thing we did when uh, we were prepared to accept patients uh, with the virus was set up an incident command center, uh, which is a center that all hospitals set up uh, to deal with mass disasters, such as would be in an earthquake or maybe in one of these raging fires. Hospitals set up an incident command center to respond uh, to disasters. At the same time, we eliminated all elective procedures, which reduced our census from about 130 a day to about 70 to 80 a day. This provided capacity if we were to get a surge in a demand from patients, much like was experienced in New York City, so that we had capacity. At the same time, we went out and aggressively acquired PPE, personal protective equipment, uh, <clears throat> nationally. And as you know, as you've heard, there was no real national response or coordination so it was every hospital for themselves trying to acquire PPE to keep their patients and their staff safe. Uh, through a connection with one of our physicians who had a connection to somebody local, who had a connection in China, we actually acquired N95 masks. The uh, shields that we use uh, to cover faces were in short supply. We actually found a local manufacturer who began making these shields for us locally. Ventilator supply, uh, we increased our ventilators from around 20 up to 69 so that we can handle that many seriously ill patients at one time. We also added two to three tents on our property uh, that were used for triage and for treating patients. And the goal there was to not only triage and then keep the COVID possible patients separate from our other patients uh, in the main ER. We increase negative pressure rooms. Uh, these are rooms where the air in the room is exhausted so as not to contaminate other parts of the hospital from a handful of negative pressure rooms upwards of over 20. Again, to be prepared to handle a surge and put them in rooms that will keep our staff and the patients more safe. And, and most interesting, uh, we're one of the first hospitals in the country to have a, a technology produced by a company called Banyan that allows us to communicate and visualize the patient remotely. So this allowed us to treat COVID positive patients without having to constantly enter the room. That did a number of things. First, it protected our staff. Secondly, we didn't have to use as much personal protective equipment because you have to change it all every time you enter the room. <clears throat> and so it also uh, allowed us to watch the patient almost on a concurrent real-time 24-7 uh, remote monitoring basis. So the hospital, uh, for one hospital competing against uh, these massive hospital systems, competing against state governments, and actually the federal government did an outstanding job of acquiring the PPE, protecting our patients, protecting our staff. We not, have not had one incident where the virus was contracted at the hospital. We now have roughly over 90 days of capacity now with our PPE and well on our way to six months. Uh, most recently, we have developed what are called supply assurance agreements with our major vendors which they agree and commit to providing us with a six month supply. And so that we will be well prepared if there is another surge uh, in the fall uh, or the winter. Uh, moving on to the next slide, please. Uh, you heard a little bit about some of the science behind the testing. Uh, testing was in very short supply. And so we had to have multiple approaches to testing. Uh, we used testing that was provided by the county, testing through our partner, UCSF, testing through Quest Laboratories. And we were one of the first hospitals in the country to get Cepheid testing. Uh, Cepheid is a company that just recently got FDA approval, and we were in line to receive this technology prior to them getting FDA approval, which was very fortunate. And this is a local company 
that allowed us to acquire these tests where other hospitals uh, had to get further back uh, in the line. We also have point of care testing. We recently contracted with a company called Color for outsource uh, testing and are acquiring yet another technology which is due in October, which will further increase our capacity for testing. Currently our testing is restricted for patients that come to the ER or patients that need to be admitted to the hospital, uh, patients that have symptoms or have people that have been in contact uh, with people that have had the virus. We hope to get to a point where we have enough capacity to support community-wide testing and also, of course, to be able to test our healthcare uh, workers. Uh, it's been a community-wide effort of collaboration uh, in attacking this virus. Uh, we work very closely with UCSF. We follow their protocols for testing, and they actually provide, as I mentioned, some testing for us. We uh, work very closely with the County of Marin. Uh, you heard from Dr. Lowe about our mobile van, which was uh, in conjunction with the county. We work very cooperatively with Kaiser. And what's interesting is the medical staff and the hospital administration work hand in glove together, as did our physicians on an inpatient basis, working with our physicians that are primarily uh, outpatients. And I really feel that this one positive outcome of this pandemic is that uh, we have developed extensive teamwork both inside the hospital and outside the hospital, which I believe will serve us well uh, into the future. Next slide, please. So as I think uh, you heard earlier, we did flatten the curve. We did not get the surge. In fact, as that played out in the hospital, uh, early on, we had maybe three patients a day, single digits for sure. Uh, that went up to a high of roughly 22 patients a day with a handful in the ICU at all times. And we're now back to running from around three to six patients a day. So the social distancing, the, wet, the mask wearing has really allowed us to flatten the curve, which has allowed the hospitals to treat patients and not become overwhelmed. In fact, we've opened up the hospital. We're back doing all elective procedures, and we're treating COVID patients very successfully, very safely, alongside other patients um, at the hospital. So we are uh, very well, I think, prepared both from an experiential basis, as well as from PPE, as well as from our testing capacity. If, God forbid, we, uh, we have another surge. And I want to mention that the, the healthcare district committed almost a million dollars of their own funding, own funds uh, in support of the community to help fund the mobile vans. We also provide take home uh, kits that include a, a, a pulse oximeter to measure oxygen supply, which is very, very important in terms of whether you're very sick or not very sick. And if you're very sick, you need to come to the hospital as well as thermometers and some PPE. Uh, we provided, the district provided some funding for a pilot project for housing people in hotels that can't go home and quarantine because of their living situation. And we also funded a pilot program on helping people with income replacement that want to go back to work even though they're sick because they need the income. So the district has really stepped up to uh, really assist in working with uh, the various other providers in the community in helping this community-wide response. I will say that uh, we did reduce our staffing when our census dropped precipitously when we eliminated all electric procedures, but to try to minimize the effect on our staff, we maintained all health benefits for our caregivers uh, while they were furloughed and we've gradually been uh, bringing our workers back as the volume has returned to the hospital. So I, I will just conclude by saying that I, I was very proud of our team, our nurses, our physicians who put themselves in harm's way, and all the support uh, that they required in terms of testing and PPE 
uh, to really be there for the community of Marin. And thank you very much. Thank you, Lee. Um, that brings us to our next presenter, Dr. David Klein. He's going to be talking about what the health, the medical center is going to be doing going forward to ensure that we all stay safe during um, this, these next few months. So take it away, Dr. Klein. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. And one of the advantages or disadvantages of going last is almost everything's been said, uh, but I think I can fill in some of the blanks. I really want to start out uh, where Lee ended, and, and that's by thanking our frontline uh, caregivers uh, who really selflessly put themselves in harm's way, uh, particularly at the early early part of the pandemic when nobody knew what to expect. And uh, couldn't be more proud of our teams uh, in the hospital. Uh, they did what they always do. They cared for the patients, even at their own risk. And so, uh, there's a lot to be proud of uh, in this organization. So I want to just spend a few minutes about what's next. And I, I think Lee did cover some of the new uh, enhanced features of the pavilion. I'll go in a little bit more detail. But how do we prepare for what people are now calling the twindemic? And that's uh, the onslaught of influenza uh, and influenza A in combination with COVID-19. Uh, some think that maybe with uh, the, the uh, protections that we're doing with the masking and the social distancing that that might allow us to have a, a lower volume flu season, uh, but nobody really knows. So everything that we are doing in the hospital going forward to create a safe environment uh, for our staff and, and for our patients and our patients' families is, uh, is, is, is focused on controlling infection. Uh, all of our team, our physicians and our staff and uh, all of our docs uh, and anybody that's involved in patient care will be getting flu vaccines. Those started in our hospital this week. And uh, it's our expectation and, and really it's mandatory that everybody be vaccinated for the flu. Then that will hopefully decrease the number of folks uh, that get it. The other question that comes up, as Jennifer alluded to, is, uh, you know, how do we keep everybody safe going forward and our hospital safe? Uh, we've seen a drop in volumes and, and, a, and consumer confidence has been low that they worry about the hospital being a safe place. I think Dr. Tolliver early on mentioned uh, that the hospitals are very safe and they are. They are the safest place you can be. We are experts at infection control. Uh, everything that we do is focused around infection. And then lastly, the people in our community, before I go into our slides, particularly in Marin, uh, are very fortunate, as are we, that we have a brand new uh, pavilion or building opening up in our hospital next uh, next week. And it was built with incredible safety features that never knowing that COVID existed and never knowing what we would need during the COVID pandemic, uh, things were put in that building that make it the ideal place to care for uh, the COVID. And I want to go over some of these features because I think it's really important that uh, that everybody understands how safe it is and the things that we've done uh, that will prevent people from spreading infection and getting infection. So next slide. So uh, space and functionality. Uh, and as I said, we never planned for uh, COVID or the folks that preceded me, uh, Lee and others never planned for something like this. But because of the way our hospital is designed, our spacious halls, uh, our rooms and our public areas, they're very large and they will easily accommodate this uh, uh, physical distancing. We have many, many more beds. We have all private rooms in our existing facility, which will still be in use. Uh, there are semi-private rooms, which as you can imagine, are not ideal uh, from an infection prevention standpoint. And there are times where uh, it's possible that one patient could contract COVID or come in and we would need to move patients to separate areas for isolation. Uh, there's less chance of exposure. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the rooms, all of which can be used for COVID patients because of uh, they can be converted to ne uh, negative pressure. Uh, we have uh, lots of capacity. We also have more ICU beds. We have plenty of ventilators if we were to ever have another surge that required uh, hospitalization in the ICU and intubation, which means we're controlling your breathing through a machine. Uh, there are separate hallways for the staff and patients. This creates uh, safer access for everybody. It also isolates our staff so that they uh, can remain healthy and be uh, and be caring for our patients in uh, the community. Next slide. Our emergency room uh, has been expanded. We have separate rooms uh, for patients who need special uh, testing and isolation, and we can do so upon entrance. All of our diagnostic areas are large and spacious with state-of-the-art equipment, which is, lends itself uh, to infection control, and then lots of great storage areas so that we can keep those ventilators and those life-saving equipment, that life-saving equipment, much closer uh, to the patient's bedside so it can be used very quickly as needed. Next slide. 
From an infection prevention standpoint, as I mentioned, every single room in this hospital, the new wing in our what we call our Oak Pavilion, uh, can be easily converted really with, a, with a, a flip of a switch into negative airflow. We actually have permanent rooms that are intended for negative airflow isolation, which can be used in the more severe cases or whenever we do a procedure uh, on the airway, uh, that can cause uh, uh, the virus to be aerosolized. And in those situations, you want a room that can contain the virus uh, to protect everybody around. And we are well equipped with those rooms in what's called an ante room that can protect people as they're entering and they can put on their PPE before they enter the room uh, for our staff safety. Uh, as Lee mentioned, we have plenty of PPE, but that now we're going to be able to keep it inside the room rather than in carts on the outside where anybody can grab it where it's, where it's not quite as uh, clean and isolated. The hospital was built with many uh, materials uh, that are infectious, uh, infection resistant and very, very easy to clean. And these are all great techniques to keep the risk of infection and protect you, the public, uh, from those areas. We have these two uh, interesting robots. You see it in the picture, they're disinfecting robots and they sanitize. They can be used in procedural rooms, uh, operating rooms in areas where we have a uh, high risk of infection and they eliminate germs and bacteria, molds, and especially viruses, including the coronavirus. Next slide. The, uh, uh, we have, as I said before, hospitals are the absolute safest place to be. We have a very stringent visitor policy. Uh, uh, those have been uh, enforced on us and, they, and, and, and rightfully so to protect our patients. Uh, from people coming in from the outside and to protect our staff as well. Everybody's screened at the door. Everybody's given a fresh mask. We check everybody's temperature. We ask them if they have their symptoms. Uh, the hospital, everybody in the hospital wears a mask, and anybody that's in a patient-facing area has to have eye protection. We're very, very good at this, and that's why we have virtually had no uh, hospital-acquired COVID cases because we've done such a great, uh, great job of protecting our staff. Um, we, we have the ability to test all of our inpatients so we know when people come in, even with uh, different symptoms that aren't quite classic, whether or not they have COVID. And then on the outpatient side, through our adult acute care clinic, we can rapidly assess uh, our staff, providers, and others as needed uh, to make sure that we have up-to-date and accurate uh, testing capabilities. Uh, next slide. And uh, Lee mentioned this briefly, but each of our rooms in, a, in our new uh, Oak Pavilion are equipped with state-of-the-art uh, uh, virtual care system, a video access to every single patient, which serves a number of purposes. We can watch our patients and make sure uh, they're not at risk for falls and other things. Uh, nurses can talk uh, to them on a screen without necessarily going back and forth in the room, uh, which they would whenever is needed and avoid some of the contact with patients. And probably just most importantly, uh, when people are quarantined, the isolation is very challenging for our patients. And the ability to interact with their friends, families, and loved ones through virtual visits right from their room. They don't have to set anything up. Uh, the families are able to participate in the care. Uh, the patients are able to get the, the, care, the, the interaction with their families. And it's just tremendous technology that very few hospitals uh, in this country have. So those are most of the features. Uh, the last slide is maybe one of the most important. And it's a, so it's a request for support. And as the, the final speaker, before we go to the questions, I just think it's important that, that everybody knows that we are 100%, everybody on this call, uh, the, the, the health district, all of our physicians, all of our ca uh, county resources, our hospital, we're absolutely committed to meeting our community's needs and really maintaining exceptional health care uh, during and after this COVID-19 pandemic. We hope it will go away. The expenses that are incurred to ensure that everybody is health and, say, and that we uh, and they're safe, including our patients, our medical professionals, and our community during this crisis are absolutely extraordinary. I think you've read in the news the the expense of, uh, that's going on in the hospitals. Uh, we're very proud our, uh, of our dedicated staff, as I mentioned at the start of my portion, who continue to work around the clock to screen, to test, to diagnose, and treat uh, COVID in all patients. And so, uh, we we'd like to ask you. Um, uh, to, to help support us while we su uh, support our community uh, by considering a, a tax deductible gift that could help support uh, our public health efforts. So there is a website on your screen. I know it's been up uh, uh, for uh, just a minute or two, but if you wouldn't mind writing that uh, that uh, link down, uh, we would we would greatly appreciate uh, any support. And Jennifer, with that, I'm going to quit and turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe Deborah, our AT person, could chat the link to everybody so people could access it that way. I'm not sure if they're able to click on it from the slide deck. 
But we have some questions that have come in, so let's move on to questions at this point. So the first question is, I recently read that workers at several casinos are receiving COVID tests to protect them, which makes sense. Why can't our frontline workers in California at the hospital, grocery stores, gas stations, et cetera, receive COVID tests? Also, why isn't testing more available in California so we can find out who is asymptomatic uh, but spreading the disease? So I don't know who wants to take that. Maybe we'll kick that over to Dr. Tolliver to start. Yeah, those are those are good questions. Those are the right questions. That's and those are the questions that we've all been asking. So any any large institution like the NBA and a casino, um, they can go to a private vendor and get the PCR testing for some of their workers on whatever uh, routine they want, uh, maybe weekly. And so the good news is is that, um, but still, if you look at all the tests that are available in California, there aren't nearly enough, and because you have to have a doctor's order to do it. Uh, but um, the focus has been on the the more the people who are more at risk. So, for example, um, workers who are at skilled nursing facilities in California now are getting tested, um, or the the recommendation is once a week, um, and that's because skilled nursing facilities, like Dr. Lowe said, have significant problems. So, um, as, as testing um, expand, um, the volume expands and the types that are available expand. We certainly want to do that. Um, we certainly want to um, test our healthcare workers more frequently. We would like, you know, workers as safe way to be tested every week, for example. Everybody, um, kids should be tested two, three times a week. They could go back to school. So the, the reason is there just aren't enough tests. Most of the tests are PCR based. So that's why I'm really hoping for cheaper tests, antigen tests um, that can be done quickly and are, and, um, are readily available. And and that's that's something we're just kind of holding out for. And in the meantime, we've got to just keep ourselves safe. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, Dr. Tolliver, can you talk about the five dollar Abbott test kits, and uh, can that be used to get kids back to school? Is the county working with schools to try something like this? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So that uh, thank you for bringing that up. That's kind of what I'm talking about is a rapid antigen test that can be done on a frequent basis. So. Um, it, you know, there's 350, 370 million people in the United States, and uh, they were going to have uh, the government purchased those like 150 million um, Abbott um, kits, so they're going to distribute them to where they need them the most. But that's exactly what we could use to get kids back to school. Uh, so one of my big frustrations is that the technology um, to do um, to produce those kind of cheap um, tests. Um, has been around for years. Uh, they're basically like a home pregnancy test. Um, so the county has wor is working with the state and the state um, testing task force to increase the capacity um, for that. Um, but I'm I am hoping that they, uh, the the state will actually have a contract with a uh, manufacturer for that kind of test. So, but it's just not here yet. So, um, and some of the science has just caught up to to the um, to the need. Uh, and there's also issues and challenges with the the, the FDA and how they're uh, approving tests. They, they're still very stringent and have to have to capture almost all the disease cases. It's a little different, and, um, with, like I said, for medical diagnosis than for population screening. But that's, if we could have have those tests, if there was an unlimited amount of out of tests, we could have them in Marin. The county could buy them, the hospital could buy them, and and they would work well if we if we used them frequently. Okay. Um, next question, and this could probably be either for Lee or Dr. Klein. Does the new hospital have negative pressure rooms? We uh, yes, we do. <laughs> we have uh, uh, many negative pressure rooms. We have some dedicated rooms, so the negative pressure in every other single room in our new Oak Pavilion room can be converted to a negative pressure. Uh, so that's a lot of rooms, and we should be able to handle any amount of surgery we would potentially see. Wonderful. Okay. Good question. Thank you. How likely is it that a really high percentage of the population eventually will contract COVID-19, being just a matter of time? Is it just a matter of time? So I guess that'd be for you, Greg. Yeah, well, so um, I think if you, just, let's say we take the population here in the Bay Area, uh, we people have been playing it safe. They listened to um, the shelter in place order. 
So we are uh, only, a, you know, 5%, maybe 10% of the population has been infected. So I suspect that it, for the Bay Area, people are going to get their immunity. If we keep doing the right things, their immunity for against COVID-19 is going to be from the vaccine, not the infection. But if you, if you were in a less developed country, you have less protection. If you um, live in a crowded um, home environment, um, if you live in an area where lots of people are not wearing masks, then the probability that you're going to get it, and if you're not doing things like wearing a mask indoors or if you're, you're, uh, you're going to a parties or something like that, your chance you're getting it and your population is going to get it is much, much higher. So the, the more you relax the social distancing at this point in time anywhere, the more rapidly the virus is going to fill that hole and, and surge right in. If you look at what's happening in in England right now, they're having a surge, and they've and really that's because it's, that the virus is going to do that. Um, so bars in particular. So it, it, a lot of it depends on on your on your uh, population's behavior, and and then how much has already been uh, how much of that population has already been infected. There is some degree of herd immunity in New York, from, for example, right now, but they're still also doing all the right stuff. Okay. Um, can we expect that the vaccines that will be released later this year will be safe? Yeah, like, uh, like I said, my, I think if we follow the usual um, uh, approval process, then I think they'll be very safe. So you're definitely going to hear about one case or two case or three cases of potential side effects. And that happens uh, with the current vaccines we have. But with the, um, if you look at how bad the disease is, um, or can potentially be if you get a lot of virus, then, then there's a risk benefit there. But in general, they're gonna follow the same rules they've had before. I think it will be very safe. So um, it would be an absolute tragedy if, tragedy if the safety that's been built in over decades for vaccines got corrupted, and something uh, and, a, and a vaccine was released that was not quite as safe as we want it to be. That would kind of really hurt our public health system. But I also think that the vaccine manufacturers are really invested you know, in making sure that they're, they're, what they put out there is really safe. They're, they're, um, it's not only. Um, the, the government's um, responsibility, but it's also the corporation's reputation hangs on the safety. So, because um, there's going to be a lot of competition for the vaccine. So, I do think that the vaccines that come out will be safe is, is the bottom line. And, and if you get instructions or opportunity to get vaccinated, then you should do it. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Tolliver. Um, we do have a question from Sandy Ross. We're going to, I think we've unmuted you, Sandy, so you can go ahead and ask your question. I understand you had challenges with the um, chat box in the Q&A panel. So if you want to ask your question now, go ahead. I do. Thank you very much, Jennifer. If I were a patient at Marin Health, would you give me hydroxychloroquine if my doctors requested it? Um, I've read a lot of papers about it, and I think I understand the arguments on both sides. And it appears that um, given early, uh, along with zinc, that it seems to be effective. And frankly, I took it myself and it worked. So, so right now, it, you would not get hydroxychloroquine at, at, if you were a patient and you had COVID-19 at, at Marin Health. Um, it, there's pretty good data that it doesn't work very well by the time um, someone was hospitalized. So um, it's just not in, um, it's not something that's potentially it's potentially very safe as well for um, the older you get if you have heart issues for example but that if you got to the, to the hospital you wouldn't definitely would not get it um, but um, I think there is still a, a chance for it potentially to be used if there's much much better data from, and much larger studies in the future but right now. It's, it's not necessary. Thank you. Okay, next question, and I appreciate everybody hanging on for a couple minutes while we get through these last few questions. How do we best tell 20-somethings that masking and separation is important since they think they're immortal, invulnerable, and unlikely to die even if they contract COVID-19? 
How many of us are dealing with this? Okay. <laughs> well, what do you recommend? And Greg, I think that's probably you again, but uh, Liz, you might have something to add to that too. Well, I kind of want to hear what Liz uh, wants to say. I think it's a huge challenge, and and I'm not sure I've got the answer, but I think that the more you uh, talk to uh, teenagers and 20-somethings um, about the science and about protecting others and how easily it's spread, um, the better. So I, I think that um, the people need to understand we're all in this together. Uh, and and there, there's lots of stories where there's been weddings, uh, some young people together, and then um, older people were there, got COVID and passed away. So um, it, it's really about protecting the people around you as well. And I think you just have to talk to them over and over and give them the science. Dr. Lowe? I, I agree with Greg. It, it's just endless, constant um, re-messaging all the time that uh, even though they're not, because 20% of the healthcare, of the, I'm on a community data-driven strategy meeting every week, and, and in the community testing, and there's still 20% asymptomatic people when we're testing. When we're catching the positives, there are not that many people who have symptoms, and so I just think it's when I look at that, it's it's you know one in five people could be asymptomatic carriers uh, around, and and age, it's not age that defines that. So that that's of the people tested. Let me clarify that that it's not in the county, but it's of the people showing up to get tested in these small subcategories of people, especially healthcare workers. It's just, it's just endless masking, endless masking and, masking and avoiding close proximity. Jennifer, uh, this is Lee DeMonaco. I really think there's a need for more mass community education. Uh, much like there was, there is around smoking, uh, much like there was around wearing seat belts, uh, there were safety issues, and I think it needs both the carrot and the stick. The education, and then if people violate the ordinances, uh, they need to be held accountable for that uh, to get the behavior we need, which is 80% of the population following these rules, so we can take the R naught down to under one and get the incident rates lower and lower and lower. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your responses. And I think this will be our last question. And again, thank you for all going over a little bit. Um, and I think this one probably is for Dr. Tolliver. How will we know which vaccine is the most efficacious? Will they be compared to one another, or will they basically be equal? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I don't know the answer to that. I, what I'm hoping is that it we don't really use a, you know, uh, uh, a Target like um, let's just go you know or and I don't want people to be buying their vaccines you know on Amazon because this one got ranked higher or, or choosing a selection of vaccines at Target it shouldn't be that way so I think that there should be guidance through people to, uh, through people's physician and through schools and through hospitals about uh, about what's the option for the general public I really think that they're probably going to need to. Um, look at their healthcare system that they're in, whether it's Marin Health or Kaiser or Sutter, and get guidance from their doctor about what vaccine is best for them, um, rather than just jump on the first one that's available. And, and I think that most of those processes are unclear at this point in time, and I hope that you don't have to make that choice for yourself. Okay, well, I want to thank all of our panelists tonight for presenting. Um, I thought you all provided some really, really helpful information for our community. We are all in this together, and it's really going to take each of us doing our part for us to make a difference. Um, again, I'll make a plug. If people feel like they are able, we can definitely take donations to help support the work um, that we are doing to address this problem in the community, which is a little bit of outside of what we normally do. Um, but there's such a need for this work, and it's really important that we've done it. And that's why the district is committed about a million dollars to this work, because we need to do this to keep our community safe. Um, so please, everyone, be vigilant. We're moving into a different 
difficult time of year um, with more movement of indoor activities and holidays coming up, and we all need to keep each other safe. And remember, we are a village and we're in this together. So thanks everybody for attending this community health education seminar, and we will be bringing you more health education seminars in the future. Have a great night and stay safe. Thank you.